Hello, my name is Ann Levy. I'm the Senior Program Manager at the Center for Faculty Development here at Mass General Hospital. I am delighted to be here today with Dr. Anne Christine Tina Duhaim to discuss her career and her transition to her current situation. I'm gonna start with a very brief introduction of Dr. Duhaim. She served as Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at MGH until May, 2021. She is the Nicholas T. Zervas Distinguished Professor of Neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. She's been a practicing board certified pediatric neurosurgeon for three decades and continues to work clinically with selected long-term follow-up patients, as well as serving as a consultant for the child protection team at MGH. In 2016, she was chosen as a fellow of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, a highly prized opportunity where she studied the neurobiology of reward circuitry and its relevance to pro-environmental behavior. She has collaborated on designing a prototype advanced green biophilic pediatric hospital, which sounds amazing. She currently serves as an associate director of the Mass General Center for the Environment and Health and is the associate editor of the Journal of Climate Change and Health. All right, so Tina, I am gonna turn this largely over to you. I have invited you here today to talk about your transition from your full-time clinical career to what you're doing now. And I wanna start off by asking you, when did you or how did you realize it was time to transition away from full-time clinical work? Thanks, Anne. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I think this was a long time coming. Um, originally, when I started in neurosurgery, I had set my clock that I would retire from clinical work at age 55. I thought that was a good time. Um, I'm fond of saying that I think surgeons retire one of two times, too soon or too late. And I always wanted to be one that retired from clinical work too soon rather than too late. On the other hand, I also had role models um, that uh, transitioned their careers to other other endeavors uh, pretty early in their career. Uh, I trained at Penn. I was the first woman uh, to go through the neurosurgery program at Penn. Um, and our chairman there uh, transitioned to becoming the head of the Pew Charitable Trust uh, in his 50s, in his late 50s. And we were shocked by this. We, meaning the other uh, residents or junior faculty at that time, because he was, you know, much younger than most surgeons transition. And I remember asking him at the time, uh, his name was Tom Langfit, what, why are you doing this? And he said, because I've done what I can do in the field of neurosurgery. And uh, he, you know, went into entirely different direction. He wanted to kind of solve many social problems in the world. Um, those of you who know anything about the Pew Charitable Trust and its foundation uh, might know that it tackles major you know, problems, uh, policy problems and um, uh, strategic problems and what direction should the world go in kind of big picture questions. So I had that as, as, a, as a model. Um, my own mentor, uh, Louis Shute, who was one of the founding fathers of pediatric neurosurgery as a sub-discipline, um, retired in his, in his mid sixties. And he was a person who made a clean break. When he was done, he was done. And yet there were other people that I saw as alternative role models who stayed on in neurosurgery. It was really their whole being um, un until, you know, they couldn't do it anymore for physical reasons. So I had always um, been torn, e even while heavily engaged in my, my clinical career, that there were other big picture questions out there that had attracted my interest, even very early in my education and career. And so I, I remember, you know, even in college, trying to decide a direction, being very drawn to big picture problems. And the one that, you know, I happened to uh, arrive in, in sync with was the concern about population. Um, 
this was a time, you know, when I was uh, of the age of secondary education where um, Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb had hit the press and, uh, you know, Rachel Carson talking about the Silent Spring and pesticides and environmental decline and the first Earth Day, all of these things were swirling at the time when I was deciding on my career. The problem was there was nothing. Once I, once I saw neurosurgery, there was nothing else that had that sort of power to draw you in. And most neurosurgeons can tell a similar story. It's just such, such a fascination um, with seeing the brain in action. And I was always interested in brain and behavior. So I went down the, the road of, of neurosurgery and ended up in pediatric neurosurgery for a whole variety of different reasons. Um, but always had in the back of my mind that that kind of a field, um, you, you get tremendous reward, tremendous satisfaction out of taking care of one patient and one you know, related family at a time. It's, it's, it's a very focused, very small scale on the global sphere, but intensely important to that child and that family. But I always had in the back of my mind that there were big big picture problems also. Uh, and so I always thought that I would make that sort of transition from very focused, very small, but very intense scale enterprises that if I had the opportunity, I would like to spend some of my career on the big picture problems. It's clear that you had other passions that were drawing you to something else beyond what you truly loved. What was most challenging about giving up your clinical career? Well, um, I mean, there is, there's just nothing comparable to doing surgery on the brain of a child. I mean, it's just, it's frightening. Uh, it, it takes intense focus and concentration. It takes a whole lot of strategy. But then when it pays off and something good happens to change the trajectory of somebody's life, it's extraordinarily rewarding and to bring a family through what to them is the most frightening, threatening thing to the most important thing in their lives, which is their child, um, and come out the other side and get to know the family and watch the child grow up and see the child and follow up and hear about what they're doing now. So it's a very, very difficult thing to give up. It's a difficult identity to give up. It's a difficult set of uh, rewards to give up. Now you haven't completely cut ties with Mass General, unlike one of your mentors that you talked about. So tell us a little bit how you put together your continuing contributions, what you wanted to do to, to maintain some kind of bond, and what kind of fulfillment that is bringing you currently. I think that I've tried to stay as available as I can to the institution. Um, if I feel that I have anything to offer. So I still, who of us doesn't love teaching residents? Residents are just the best. They're, they're so uh, capable and mm -hmm. uh, they're such good people and they're, they, they come from such varied backgrounds. I mean, they're just fascinating. And we are truly privileged to get extraordinary people. So I love interfacing with and teaching the residents. Um, I have research assistants that are often students, undergraduates from different schools. They are also great fun to work with. So, you know, if I can offer anything in those regards to mentor people or to interact with them or to share some of the things I've learned, that's ex extremely um, rewarding and fulfilling. And I hope has some value to the, you know, people I interact with. Um, in addition, I mean, you know, when you get to know children as they're growing up, there are some families that you're very connected to. And when I have the opportunity to continue to see those kids and their families and to interact with them, trying hard not to get in the way or, or interfere with new people taking over their care, uh, that also is a real privilege. So I, I try to do that. And then with respect to the institution, um, you know, as I've gone in line with a longstanding interest in um, its switch from population really to uh, climate change, which I think is our biggest threat. If I have an opportunity to contribute some energies to the hospital and to the academic community here and at our you know, um, sponsoring institutions academically, 
this also is a, a, a privilege because there are extraordinary people in many, many, many fields working on these things um, at the university and at other universities around town. Um, if I can interact, learn from, uh, and contribute to those efforts, that's another privilege. How did you learn about the opportunity and what role did that fellowship play in helping you transition to what you're doing now? Right. Um, I learned about that th through um, another uh, attending in neurology. I'm in neurosurgery, but this was Alice Flaherty in neurology, an extraordinary person, a writer. And she had done one of these fellowships. And that's how I learned about it. Um, I I was extremely fortunate. They had never taken anybody with this sort of bizarre interest in brain and behavior as it applies to our environmental um, quagmire. Uh, it's an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, you know, they take 50 people from around the world and they're not people in academic medicine. I mean, once in a while there are, but these are biologists and artists and filmmakers and choreographers and sociologists. I mean, from all over the gamut of of you know intellectual pursuits and from all over the world and i met just amazing people there some of them were writers some of them were scientists um one of the people i got closest to was uh, a, a composer from uh, who grew up in hiroshima japan i mean th these were just amazing people so it really takes you out of the narrowness that we get into right and so this opportunity I, I learned that there were people, even in the sciences, that really were kind of climate deniers. I mean, it's like, are you kidding? But these are really smart people. So the point is, it broadens your perspective. And so I, um, I delved into this area. It, it gave me the freedom to do this. And I give Mass General, my department, and my colleagues tremendous credit for allowing me to do this and for covering for my clinical work um, while I did it, which you know, that's, that's a lot to ask. And, and I was, I was really blessed that way. Um, and I uh, started to put some of this work together and a, a book came out of it, which is uh, going to be released in a few weeks um, in October, 2022 called Minding the Climate, how neuroscience can help solve our environmental crisis. Now, one thing I will say is um, <laughs> I don't think it solves anything, but it's a perspective. Uh, the title, the title is a title that, uh, gets chosen in part by your publisher. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want to make an overstatement by that title, but Minding the Climate is really about how one can use neuroscience as a lens to look at this problem. That is, what is it about the way our brains evolved and are designed that um, makes this particular problem so difficult for us and makes it difficult for us to pivot our behavior, not just as individuals, but as leaders, as people with influence over others, as managers of institutions or companies, um, you know, how, how does that lens help us understand things? So uh, it was truly transformative to um, help with that career pivot because I really was struggling with how to go from expertise in one thing to non-expertise in another, but something I wanted to explore. Uh, and I will say that the Harvard University Center for the Environment, under the direction of Dan Schrag, uh, was extremely helpful in um, validating the fact that this was a topic worth exploring just because somebody wanted to do it. And it's an example of what advantages we have in a center like this with the academic affiliations that we have that allow us to consider these kinds of pivots in mid-career. And it sounds like you have made a tra transition that truly fits who you are. Can you describe one or two particularly satisfying aspects of your current situation? Well, one of them is that if I had been if I had been myself younger and somebody had asked me, you know, what do you think you're going to be like in your sixties? I can remember struggling with turning 50 because I kind of thought it was the end of something, you know, valuable. And actually of all the people that I went through that struggle with, the person that was most helpful to me was my son. Um, 
And he, he studied sociology and journalism in college. And so he was heavily into these ideas. And he finally said to me, mom, you're really struggling with this turning 50 thing. What does it mean to you? What does 50 mean to you? And I remember, nobody had asked me that question. I remember thinking about it. Um, and I came up with the answer that it meant to me in, emotionally, Mrs. Claus, like Santa Claus's wife, like that's what 50 in my head meant to me from being on the you know, other side of it for all those years on the, on the down side of it. And he said, well, mom, now again, this is, you know, I'm in my sixties now. So this is some time ago. He said, why can't it mean Susan Sarandon? And, you know, it was the first time that I thought about, you know, these ideas about aging have meanings to us that we're carrying from, you know, our own background or concepts or whatever. Um, and I remember, uh, of all people, I don't want to be political here, but Hillary Clinton saying 60s was your power decade. And whether that's true or not, the point is a lot of what your decade is, is what you make of it or what you think about it. So I think one thing that has been surprising to me about this transition is how much you can take on the opportunity to learn about new things. I will say that the expertise that you develop in something very narrow that you do for many decades is a, an expertise of depth. And when you switch in your later career, you're never going to have the same depth of expertise. You're just not. I'm not an expert. I, I'm not an expert. I have to rely on the expertise of others. And so you have to give up that people are going to come to you for expertise um, unless, you, unless you do something very narrow. So I think the, both the opportunity to continue to learn and grow. Um, I'm not sure I would have predicted that. And the recognition that you're not going to be the best at it because you simply don't have the time to develop the depth of expertise and the credibility that you might have had had you stayed in the same path. That said, so what? So that's why you collaborate. That's why you turn to others. That's why you have humility and say, I really don't know about this, but I need to. So can you help me? Um, and you just have to follow your own path and do what you can and realize you can't solve every problem, but you can do what you can do. And maybe that's something. Um, that said, you know, you can do what you can do. I never thought I would write a, a book for the lay public uh, on, on, on the brain and its, its, its relation to our environmental crisis. Um, so, you know, you're going to have new opportunities uh, that you wouldn't have predicted. I think maybe that's one of the satisfying things is realizing you can't control and you can't predict everything. You just have to do what you can with what you have and do the best you can and make the choices that come up um, by fate or by luck or by effort uh, and run with them until you need to change direction again, because you can't accomplish what you want to in that particular endeavor. Clinicians, um, we're used to never giving up, you know, whether it's for a patient, like you need something for your patient and you're just going to fight for it. And I guess if there's a, you, you asked about satisfactions, I guess if there's still a struggle, that struggle is still being unwilling to give up and that you, you still want to do more. You, you want to accomplish more. You want to influence things more. You want to make things happen. We, you don't just give that up if that's in your personality. And I can imagine that there's a high percentage of clinicians at Mass General and, and our you know, sister organizations. There's a high percentage of people that have that as a personality trait. And so that tension between knowing that you may not accomplish the things that are your goals and still not wanting to give up, that's a tension that maybe you carry forever. What matters most to you at this stage of your life, Tina? You know, one of the things I had to delve into a bit for the book was the difference between reward and happiness. Reward is short term. It's what you get from doing a good operation or having a, a productive educational session with a family so that they get it and you see that they get it and they see that you're on their side. Those are rewards. They're extraordinarily rewarding. That's why we do it. Um, Long-term happiness, it's been shown, comes from two main sources, a sense of purpose 
in your relationships. And when you say what matters, um, I think I'm still struggling with that sense of purpose. Uh, I can't give up that I should be doing something to uh, have a purpose to make a difference. And, you know, I think we get addicted uh, in our careers, in our high powered careers to, to that kind of success and sense of purpose. And I think finding it later in your life, later in your career pivots or your personal life or other things you take on, um, I think that's a challenge. So I think what matters to me is figuring out from here how to how to um, use your energies in ways that still have that sense of purpose and also investing in your relationships. Um, Cause those are the, those are the two that matter. Is there anything else you would want our other faculty to know about major transitions such as what you have gone through? I think only this, Anne, it's extraordinary how much a little bit of kindness and a little bit of empathy, how far that goes. And if, you know, if your work relationships, if there's one person who is empathetic with what you're going through, or you can offer that to someone else, uh, it's, it's so much more powerful than we recognize. You know, I think the only thing I would say is don't underestimate your own impact on others. Um, and recognize that even people who you think don't need it, need a kind word from time to time, and that your actions in that regard um, may be life altering.